Hey, Tom, thanks for having me today. Amy's helping me out behind the camera and feed me some questions, so let her rip. John, tell us a little bit about your background and some history before you joined Donna's band, including working with other entertainers on her level. I don't think I ever worked with anybody at her level to that point. I mean, she was, I went from, from here to there in an afternoon. It was pretty amazing. But I used to work with a lot of rock guys in Los Angeles. I moved to LA in, in 1987 and I went wanting to play R&B and jazz. And as it turned out, cause I was like a long haired rocker looking guy, I ended up getting kind of pigeonholed in that, which I didn't mind, it was fun. I had a blast. Um, I got to play with some cool rock guys that I, I respected and admired. Some of the people that I guess were named people that I played with as I played with jazz singer Nancy Wilson uh, one time with a, an amazing keyboardist named Johnny Hammond Smith. And uh, I played with Norman Brown with Johnny. And Norman Brown's a, as a, as a smooth jazz guitar player, kind of in the vein of George Benson. He's an amazing guitar player. I played with a bunch of rock guys, probably not too many people will remember. And um, I got to do some amazing things, but nothing really stuck out in Los Angeles. So I moved to Nashville. And about a month and a half after I moved to Nashville in 1995, I got a call from a friend who wanted me to cover him for an audition. Um, actually, not an audition, but a rehearsal. And the rehearsal was kind of a secret audition, and it was for Donna Summer. And I kind of went with the attitude <laughs> that it wasn't going to happen, and this was a big joke, and I don't know even know why they asked me. And in the end, I got offered the job that day. And a week later, we were in rehearsals, and probably a few weeks after that afternoon, I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil, getting ready for um, almost a two week run in, in Brazil after a show in, in Florida. And I mean, I had not done anything like that in Los Angeles or to my, at that point in my life. And all of a sudden it was for real. It was pretty incredible. That was in 1995, probably in late April, early May of 95 when all that kind of went down. And then that tour was at the end of May, that Brazilian tour. And then from there on, it was 17, 16, 17 years later that uh, I had an amazing run with her. Okay. So would you consider <clears throat> the real Nashville dream come true? <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's, they call that a Nashville dream, but I mean, it didn't really work out that way. I mean, it wasn't country music, but it was, um, it was a dream come true. I mean, I moved to Los Angeles to play music full time. That was going to be my job. And I didn't really acquire that. It was eight years of just constant struggle from the day I got there to literally to the day I left. To the point in the last six months I lived there, I quit playing bass just out of sheer frustration. And all my friends from Virginia, where I'm from, had all moved to Nashville and they were doing great. They were, they were touring and playing in Los Angeles and I wasn't. And I just knew something was wrong and all of them said, come to Nashville. So I had a ready-made network that was embracing me and, uh, and want me to be there with them. And I did, I just loaded up the car, said goodbye and, and moved to Nashville. And I guess then, yeah, in a sense, the Nashville dream came true. It just wasn't with Garth Brooks or a country artist. It was with Donna Summer. Question number two. I know you were Donna's bass player in the band. The band was awesome and always kept the crowds on their feet. Some of us feel we know each and every one of you and we would tailgate and go to as many shows and travel as long as we had to to attend how did you get involved with being so honored at donna's band i think you just i think i just yeah i think we covered that one you're good it was a really strange set of cool circumstances uh, a dear friend of mine that's passed away now was actually her bass player and he left he left the band and that opened up a, um, a hole for a new bass player to come in. And it was completely, I was literally sitting on the couch watching TV and an uh, hour and a half, two hours later, I was at rehearsal. It's pretty nutty. Question number three. What was it like to you seeing all of Donna's devoted fans all over the world? She was always so giving to them. The last tour crayons looked like it was amazing and well put together. 
and you all looked so happy and energized, but I'm sure it was a hard pace to keep up with. No, it really wasn't. We didn't work. We didn't work like some groups go on the road and they're gone. They don't come home for six months. I have friends that, that do that. It's hard. It's very difficult on your family and it's hard on you to be gone that long. Donna had a pretty reasonable pace. We would do chunks of of shows, you know, two or three weeks. I think the longest I was ever away from home with Donna was 21 days, so three weeks. And the rest of the time were what we call one-offs. I'd fly out, do a show, fly back. So for crayons, I think we, ho we hopped on a bus. I don't really remember, but I imagine we hopped on a bus and did a, a nice set of run, a run of shows. And then we would, we would go and do one-offs the rest of the year. It was a great pace. It never was, it always felt like it was not enough. <laughs> um, I felt like we were like, we could have just stayed on a road, but I had a family and everybody else in the band had families. We couldn't be gone that long, but um, it was a great pace. And, and, and it was one that Donna was able to do without stressing herself out. And we were able to do without stressing ourselves out. It was, it was great. Question number four. I recently saw a clip on Facebook where you and Donna seemed to be having a lot of fun together with hot stuff. What was your favorite song of Donna's? Wow. I mean, I had lots of favorites. I had favorites that I liked to play as a bass player that were fun to play. Like, I always liked to play Magic. And uh, I loved playing Love to Love You Baby, although she, um, it was funny, she loved the bass line. So she had me open the song, and the song really doesn't open with bass. So it was, <laughs> I'd always feel a little pressure at the top of that tune to play it right. And she knew it exactly. And if I didn't play it exactly, she let me know the next day. But uh, I love playing Magic, love playing Love to Love You Baby. Uh, Dim All the Lights was always, to me, kind of technically, um, that sounds silly to say, but technically challenging because I, it, you know, had to sit in the pocket and be interesting and cool and disco-y and I always remembered having to wake up, you know, wake up, dim all the lights, it's time to play that song. My favorite Donna song on the radio was, uh, not on the radio, but um, that, I like, that I like to listen to was Finger on the Trigger. Like, I just couldn't believe that song. And uh, my wife is behind the camera going, me too, me too. Me too! too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The most. I mean, live that song. I think that song had a hard time translating because it's programmed, and when you put a live band on a programmed track, it just, it just never had the life that it had, and we so we didn't really bring it into the set. Uh, I think we tried one time because I said something. I was running my mouth, and I said we need to do finger on the trigger. And then as soon as we do it, I'm like, maybe we shouldn't do finger on the trigger. <laughs> That's what I was thinking the whole time. Um, but I love that song. I love that track a lot, and. Uh, I always like heaven knows I got to play that the other night in a nightclub here in Nashville and uh, with a great singer and it was Shireen yeah Shireen uh, sang that song and it was great I was like man I forgot how cool this tune is so um, heaven knows is fun too in saying that when you started working with Donna were you surprised by her vocal ability and her stage presence well yeah I was uh, the woman had pipes like nobody. And um, it was amazing she'd hold the mic out. It drove the sound man crazy, I know. <laughs> but she would hold her mic out like this and sing. And she had serious pipes. I never heard her have a bad night. I heard nights when she um, maybe wasn't feeling well from travel and stuff, but she would go out there and deliver. And it was, it was really remarkable to see her have that consistency. And that's something that you don't see often. Um, and I saw it with her, it was amazing. And she expected that consistency of us, us. And if we, if she felt like we weren't delivering that, whether we felt like it or not, if she didn't, again, she'd let us know. And the next night we'd have to step things up. Um, but yeah, she's an incredible singer. I, I watched her sing on more than one occasion with her and just a piano and um, at sound checks. Just amazing. Refreshment. Refreshment. For your enjoyment, there's hot, fresh popcorn. Tempting, delicious hot dogs, and so many kinds of ice cream. Tom said he had a chance to stay in Nashville a few years ago and visited Donna's home, her grave site, and hung out with Mimi and Rick and the kids. And it was so nice to see the city and hang with them. And they're so down to earth. Do you see them or Bruce much since Donna's passing? Well, Bruce moved to Los Angeles after Donna passed away, so I haven't really been able to catch up to him other than a few texts here and there. And I got to spend some time with Amanda and Abner, 
uh, when they were recording one of the Johnny Swim records, and that was a blast. Uh, Brooklyn, I think, is out in Vancouver, and I, I have not seen her since her mama passed, but I would love to see all of them again. And Mimi's here in Nashville, but you know, she's mom, Rick's working, our lives are all busy, and that's no excuse. So hopefully I can, uh, I can call up Rick and we can go get a beer or something and hang out. But they're great people, and they are down to earth. They are who they seem to be. They're great, wonderful people. And Donna, as a mother, and Bruce as a father, did a fantastic job with those kids. Donna had many nicknames for her band members. Did you have one? I don't think so. She would call me Billings. Uh, and what did she call me? Oh, she was the one I think you started the Bill Johnnings thing. Sometimes she, her dyslexia got the better of her. And I think she called me... She, I think she introduced me or something as Bill Johnnings, not John Billings. And that kind of s stuck between the band. I think they were calling me Bill Johnnings a little bit, just messing with me. Um, and Randy, she used to call Randy the candy man. I never really understood, except for the fact that it rhymes with Randy, <laughs> why, why it was the candy man. But, um, and then Michael, Michael Hanna, the, the older musical director, used to be, I think he was Big Bird. Because he's tall and lanky, and he always kind of did his head when he walked. So she called him Big Bird. But we all called him Big, Big Bird. Even Michael referred to himself that way. But um, I think that was it. I think that was all the nicknames that I could remember. The band was so tight, and it seemed watching some live performances, Donna had some of her hand signals to the band when performing. Was this true or just something that was not really what it seemed? Hmm. Interesting. The hand gestures were, you'd see her do her thumb, like you'll see her, she'd hold her thumb out and she'd shake it and move it out to the right or to the left. And that, those hand signals, sometimes she'd move her thumb up or whatever, those were for the, the monitor man, because the monitor man was mixing her in-ear monitors while she was performing. So sometimes she wanted more reverb or she wanted it to be louder or she wanted changes made on the fly during the performance. So you might see her hold her mic up and the other hand's going out like this. And that was really for the monitor guy more than for us. Typically, once the show started, we um, there weren't any changes. And if there was an audible, it was usually in, in a set list. And she'd walk over to to uh, the musical director. Or she Sometimes she'd walk over to me and go, skip to the next song. And, and uh, the later part of the, you know, when we were all on in-ear monitors, the later part of uh, my time with her, I had a microphone next to me with a button on stage, uh, like a pedal button, and I would step on it. And when I spoke into the microphone, everybody on stage could hear what I was saying. Um, and the button was so that the microphone wasn't on constantly. And I would try to translate whatever it is she said to me to everybody else, and we'd change songs and move along. Being in this kind of band, it seems like tensions and stress would be abundant. All of you seem to handle it so well and get along famously. Donna may have played a role in keeping everyone together as much as possible. How was Donna's interaction with the band in stressful times? I know she was a funny person. Did her sense of humor lighten things up? Yeah, I mean, she was always kind of silly and funny, but she was the boss and we were working for her. So if there was any stress and tension, we were all professionals, we are professionals. So if there was something going on from earlier in the day or a technical issue that was plaguing us in soundcheck, we wouldn't address it to Donna and we would show up with smiles on our face, ready to work. And then after Donna was gone, maybe then we'd address it. <laughs> we, wouldn't, we wouldn't drag her into whatever technical musical drama was going on at Soundcheck, which was rarely happened. But sometimes you show up and, um, you know, you haven't slept a while and you're aggravated and your ears don't sound right and you want to address that. And, and when she came on stage, it was Donna's time, not really, you know, our time. So, uh, there wasn't any stress or tension that I, that I feel like. We were all professionals. We were all there doing a job. And as much as we loved her and loved playing music, we were there for her, which meant that we were supporting her. So it was a good, good group of people that worked around her. Have you seen the Broadway show yet? What are your thoughts about it? And what do you think about Donna finally getting some of the respect she deserves as one of the best vocalists of all time. Well, she needed that respect, and I was always a little sad that when she passed away, I just assumed that there would be a show immediately, and I assumed that there'd be Greatest Hits records, and I assumed that she would be treated 
kind of like how Michael Jackson was when when he passed. That there was you know a movie and there was everyone talked about it and, and it was just really quiet. And I was a little sad about that. Um, it just kind of she passed away and then that was it. So I'm thrilled now that there's a show and I'm really excited that the people are are learning more about her. And I haven't seen the show yet. I'm dying to see it. I had wanted to go and see it in San Diego with my lovely wife. But uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and save up our money and go to New York and see it. So I'm excited about the show. It's, it's time that that happened. And one last question, which would be, um, Tom says, as we all know, Donna is and always will be not only one of the world's most talented performers of all time, but also, along with that, a gracious person, mother, wife, sister, painter, and more. What is your favorite memory of Donna, and what more can you add to how you feel about her and the impact on your career and life in general? Well, she she kept me around for a long time, and that made a giant impact on my professional career. Um, that was pretty cool. There were times there where I was, I felt like I might not be here much longer, and she hung on to me, and that was really cool. Um, she was always great to my family. She treated my mom like I was like, she she would talk to about me to my mom like I was the man. You know, my mom just would beam with pride, and she would she treated my family super super well. She loved my girls and doted on them and made a big stink about when the girls would come. And that was really cool. It made me feel great. She would take us to dinners on occasion. And we'd go out to a nice, beautiful, fancy place and, and uh, spoil us with food and wine. And that was cool. And I mean, the experience of going around the world to Monte Carlo and, uh, you know, parts of Italy. And my God, we just we did so many cool things with her. And she would include us with some of the stuff that she was doing. That first trip that we did to Brazil, we got to go on some like excursions with the promoter with Donna. And uh, that's a rare thing. It became a rare, rarer thing later on because promoters wouldn't spend that time and money. But with Donna around, we got to do some of those things. And she was great. She was a cool hang. You know, my time with her on our work days was really brief because we were working. But she'd come over and ask about the family and how's everybody doing and um, how old are the kids? And you know, that, was, that's, that made my day. That's all I want to talk about as a kids anyway. Okay, so this is not on the script, Tom, but I'm going to ask Oh, one more we're going off script, huh? Okay. Off script now. Okay, so do you have any funny stories that you just want to share? Just like maybe one funny story. There's probably none that I can actually share if I'm getting into trouble with some other band members, but uh, I used to prank um, I used to prank a little bit. So one of the things Donna had a she had a giant piano on stage on a, on a riser, and the riser was actually hollow. It had her dressing room in it with a mirror and a light, and I would leave her messages on the mirror sometimes. We had a musical director, and I would leave her love notes from him, and sign his, fake sign his name to it on her mirror, because if she's in a hurry, she's between songs, and she's getting ready to get her dress on, she's looking at her face, and there on the mirror would be this note. <laughs> A love note or something, and then she'd have to rush out on stage, and I knew that that would uh, that played with her a little bit. And then I would go. There's a song where she wanted me hidden away, so I would just back up into that dressing room area, and uh, she had a spritzer bottle, a water spritzer, and I would change the nozzle to spray, and then I would go out of the side of the riser and I'd squirt the drummer Marcus Finney while he's playing. He's got to play, and I'm shooting him in the face with water. Um, but that was always fun. We had a good time. Um, I had a good time with that. <laughs> and just try to like, you, you know, we're doing a job there, but every now and then we would sneak a prank in or something and, and, uh, and have, a, have a good time. And sometimes she knew about it and sometimes she didn't. One time we were in Vegas and she used to have a trunk of wigs, like a, literally like a gigantic rolling trunk of wigs. And everybody on stage put on one of her giant wigs. I had a, like a, a fro wig on. And we went out for, for a song. And I think I played Bad Girls with uh, the wig on. And I wish somebody had a, a photo of that, but no such luck. Lots of stories. There's tons of stories. And uh, I just need to leak them out one at a time every now and then because I'd be, I'd be here all day. <laughs> and so how long were you with her? I mean, I started in 95 until she died. But the, the year when she passed away... We hadn't worked for, I hadn't worked with her for a year. She hadn't done any shows, and she did, uh, 
she did a show, I think, in Europe where she didn't take the band, and then she did something with uh, David Foster and used his band. So the last, the last time we sp spent any time together working was in Beijing at a, um, at a corporate job in the Forbidden City for Tiffany. I think it was for Tiffany's. Um, and it was incredible. And we, the last conversation I had with her was talking about how cool is it we're in China and we're playing in the Forbidden City. I mean, who gets to do that? And she was like, is, she was as, as excited about it as I was. And that was cool that we had that moment to chat about that. And I remember saying, wouldn't it be great we're here in China if we could just bounce over to Singapore or go to Japan and go to Australia? We could just stay over here for like a month and do shows. She's like, yeah, that would be amazing. And, and that was it. It's the last time we ever spoke. Okay, and I'm going off script one more time. Whoa, I, uh, I give then, the floor to you. Go ahead. And, and then. then we're done. But, um, so would you like to say anything to the fans that have reached out to ask for this interview and that have watched you for all those years on stage with you? Uh, well, I'd like to tell them all thank you. And um, it's very humbling. I mean, everybody in the band felt that way. Um, it's nice because when you're on stage with Donna, you're, you're a little invisible. <laughs> And I'll, I'll say that in a bad way. I mean, you know, it's Donna on stage. And I'm sure people that work for Whitney Houston felt that way. And people who work for Diana Ross felt the same way. You know, everyone's focusing on Donna. So it's kind of nice, you know, after she's, she's been gone, that uh, fans reach out sometimes and ask stories or just say hi. I get people that will send a Facebook message saying thanks. And they appreciated, um, you know, seeing us up there, having fun with her. And it just, you know, it makes you feel like you were, you were actually part of the you were part of it more so than, you know, when you're in it, it didn't always feel that way. I just felt like I was just doing my job and going back to my room. So it's been nice to get an interaction from the fans. It's been really cool. And, and thank you. And that's a wrap. And that's a wrap. Tail slate. <laughs> Thanks, baby.